the bridge, and they had eastbound and westbound lanes running across. Then over the years, got busier and busier, and then the uh, 1990, they decided to build another length of bridge. So they built a new one right next to the old one. Then they closed down the old one, opened up the new one, and they started to work on the old one to clean it up and, and repair all of the pontoons. And what that required was for them to drill into the pontoons themselves to get in there and pressure wash and sort of clean out the pontoons and get them all back up to a to good working condition on sites or volcano evacuation routes signs everywhere down there in the valley community. So it's actually a, a pretty present threat, uh, but uh, still a couple hundred years off in the distance. Well, with that, Captain Jay is going to pilot us over to the eastern side of the lake. We just see the skyscrapers of Bellevue appearing ahead of us into the left. Uh, I'm going to take a break off the microphone, do some deck handing rounds, make sure everything's good, and uh, then I'll be around on the outer decks. If anybody has any questions, feel free to stop me. We have quite a lot of you on board today, so I might not be able to chime in with all of you. So if you have a pressing question, do flag me down. I'll be right over to see to your needs with that. Also, if you'd like me to take a picture with you and your group, feel free to ask me. It could have something to do with the foundation of Seattle. Well, so in 1851, the Arthur Denny Party uh, traveled to the location. They uh, went across the land of Portland, Oregon, and then they sailed north and down through the Puget Sound area. And they settled on Alki Point. So for those locals, you know Alki Point is out on West Seattle. We also know it's pretty windy and sort of unprotected out there. So when they started the city, they called it what? New York Alki. They wanted to get that house over there, the Micah. Coast, this yeah, huge trading there. city. But the settlement didn't hold out very well. It was very windy. None of the ships could really stop there to trade. So finally, Chief Seal, a local Native American chief, suggested they relocate to the south end of Elliott Bay. Oh, yeah. And so they did that. They had much better luck. And they changed the name of the city to Seattle. Uh, but uh, the original name there was New York Alki. So if you go out to Alki Point today, you can actually see a large statue of liberty there as well, sort of tying together that whole history. Also coming up is this yellow Spanish-style building. Uh, you can also see a track just to the left of it that runs up the hillside. And this track is what we call a funicular tramway. What these do is they're basically a quick way up and down the hillside without having to expend too much effort to walking up and down large staircases. So uh, we'll see a lot of these with the homes. You may have noticed there aren't many streets that connect the this. homes up to the top of the hillside. And this has to do with uh, why this place is so popular for these homes. Yeah. When they opened up the Lake Washington Ship Canal, they had to equalize all the levels of water between them. So a lot of the shallower bays were then filled in by the water that drained out of Lake Washington. They lost about nine feet of water out here, over 30 square miles. Huge amounts of water flooded into the Lake Washington Ship Canal, and that's what has allowed uh, that uh, canal to be traversable by a lot of the watercraft here. But one of the effects was it left behind this gently sloping hillside right down along the coastline that became a prime area for real estate developers to build homes. So that's why all of these homes, these large mansions, are built out here. Most famously, though, coming up in just a moment, and that is the estate of Bill Gates. So we're coming up just on it now. You can see the American flag with the black pole. That's actually about the starting point of his 415 feet of waterfront property. And that waterfront property extends all the way over to the left. You can see three speedboats with gray tops. So pretty much all of the clusters of buildings in between those two points are owned and uh, part of the Bill Gates estate. It took about seven years to build out here, and it cost of $54 pole. million. Dollars. You can see the main estate there now, just peeking out behind the trees. And this is built in sort of the northwestern style of architecture to build sort of behind the trees, sort of within the nature, rather than clearing it all out. You can also see the grand staircase there, and down at the shoreline, a little beach area. It's actually imported. They bring the sand in from the Philippines and Hawaii, and uh, they reconstruct that beach every year whenever it gets washed away. But this is the Bill Gates Estate. It's actually the smartest home in the world, as ranked by the Guinness Book of World Records. So run by about 100 different computers, 64 kilometers of fiber optic cable, keeping it all together. And this runs functions like uh, if we were visitors, for example. We would fill out a little survey, and it would ask us what our favorite music is, our favorite artwork. 
uh, preferred temperature, preferred lighting, no. and program all of that into a small lapel pin that we would wear on our shirts while we were in the home. And as we went from room to room, the temperature and the lighting would change, the music would change. We have digital screens in the walls, so the paintings would change as you went from room to room. Very intelligent home. Uh, if you're in a room by yourself and the phone rings, the phone's for you. If uh, you go up to a door and it doesn't open, it means you're not important enough and you have to get better security clearance. So it'll actually keep you out of rooms you're not allowed to go inside of. Um, but again, you can see the main lodge just coming into view again from behind the trees. That's where you'll find the six bedrooms, seven kitchens, or at least most of the seven kitchens. The home in its entirety has 24 bathrooms. Why do you need 24 bathrooms in a home? Well, the reason is they have a huge entertainment hall. So they do a lot of dinners and uh, um, inviting people over. And uh, they can fit about 150 people for dinner, 200 people for cocktails if they take out all the tables and chairs. Now, if you have 200 people at your home drinking cocktails, you want 24 bathrooms. That's, uh, that's the reason for the 24 bathrooms. There's a lot of those the, the entire living space is about 50,000 square feet with an additional 16,000 square foot car garage that's built underneath the hillside. So he sometimes calls that the Bat Cave, a little jokingly, so all his guests can park when they come to visit. A lot of other fun things in the home. He has an indoor-outdoor Olympic-sized swimming pool. He has a 20 by 20 foot trampoline room for the kids. He also has a 1,000 square foot domed library, and inside of that is the world's most expensive book, the Codex Lester. It's a private sketchbook of Leonardo da Vinci, and they purchased that at auction for $30.8 million. So uh, they actually led that tour around with a lot of museums and universities, kind of letting everybody experience that. Uh, but it is the most expensive book in the world. Now I mentioned briefly uh, the Northwest style of architecture. There's a home just coming up to the right. Opportunities here in the summer. Get the bridegroom photos and, and the bridesmaids and everything, all their photos taken with the mountain in the background there. This next point of land is known as Hunts Point. And you might notice something a little bit peculiar about it already. It's a little more spaced out than some of the other places we've seen before. And the reason is, this is a very narrow strip of land. There's actually only one street that runs down the center of it. And uh, as a result, it's a very private little community.